it makes sense to cross market though. I mean, I'm certainly, I know they have a large uh, senior they, that maybe would be interested in some of the adult ed classes. I don't know. I'm just well, revenue wise, we probably would be having to share that revenue, and we are kind of <coughs> trying to maintain our program. Part, so. part of the reason that we split away from having, we just have a joint um, brochure or mm -hmm. a mailer that we <coughs> services, if I remember correctly, they decided they wanted to have their brochure strictly online. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we, at that point, said, well, we really still, like, we think that our um, our audience really still wants that paper document to come to their house. So that's why we started doing our own brochure. Um, I don't know if Community Services has gone back to doing a paper version, no, but I haven't have seen new, one. We more. have a new director coming in, so that's why I'm wondering yeah, if there's anything preventing us you know, legislatively or regulatorily requirements uh, I mean, more than making us separate it out for... Sit down with the new director and see what we could do, okay. hear what his ideas might be and how many okay. other districts are. I do know a lot of them are very separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. There would not, not be anything preventing us from marketing together. Um, I think that the education programs, as Joanne says, some of that is subsidized by the state. We do actually receive some funding from the state strictly for the education piece. Um, so, I mean, that's where some of the division comes in in terms of programming, but no reason why you couldn't yeah. try to reach the same audience. Yeah, yeah. and I know that um, in my conversations with our commissioner, he is very um, supportive of the adult ed programs and wants to see them grow and flourish and was really curious about our, how we were maintaining ours. So I think that's going to become um, a focal point for the department in the next year. Jackie? Yes, we have in our midst the, the driving force behind community services adult ed <coughs> program. When John Thurlow chaired the Board of Education, he, in fact, was a prime mover. The first director was director of both programs. And that lasted two years, John? Four. Four. And then it was determined uh, that the town should really take over community services and that the school department should take over adult ed. And that was how many years ago? <clears throat> 84, I think. See how old it is? <laughs> but there was a, a great team of people that put that model together based on, I think, on the people who model at the time. And there was a commission that ran it. Efforts of the town and school to work together yep. through that commission model. So it's been nice that that has been preserved over the years, and now look what we have. Yeah. Uh, amazing. <coughs> you provided that leadership, I can tell you that. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs> Old has been. <laughs> okay, yeah. transportation. Oh, oh, Mary has one. Oh, Mary. Mary. As far as the Adult Ed program. Now, as, as I know you've mentioned the business school partnership. Has there been anything working with business school partnership and adult ed? Is there, you know, like, has there been any connection there? Um, that hasn't been on the agenda no. this year since I've been attending. But Monique, do you know if that was a point of conversation in the past? <coughs> I'm sorry, I was looking up the ratio of nurses. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were um, um, Mary's question was about. Oh, go ahead. Adult Ed and um, <coughs> School Business Partnership. We have not had um, a okay. conversation about it. I was wondering if there's a need at, like, mm -hmm. say, paper shortages, and they offer space. You know, like, is that yeah. something that, you know, Interesting. What kind of space you know, businesses have that Well, and we've kind of played with the idea, too, <coughs> to Jackie's question earlier about are our students accessing the programs through the adult ed, but creating like a sunset academy. Some, some districts have moved to a model like that where students who want to take additional courses and extend their day have an option to do that <coughs> through that same structure. Um, and not necessarily in the same classes with other adult learners, but um, there are some models that we could explore in looking at that too. I think five years ago we looked at offering Chinese after school that we did not have, uh, and it was for high school students, but we had like three kids who signed up and we couldn't run the program. Yeah. Well, if you were looking to offer programs during the day, Cabela's has two rooms that you can use for free that they can open up into a big room and the 
Lions Club has a whole building on 114 that is rarely used. The CNA program, when we were trying to do that, Joe went all over, but the problem is that you have, have the equipment, the equipment and they beds. don't want the equipment. You can't move that equipment. We have, as a matter of fact, we, have, we hire somebody to move those hospital beds, and so those places don't want those hospital beds there. <laughs> hospital beds at St. Max. Yeah, we did that at St. Max, too. <laughs> they actually have the, the practicum, like a, a pipeline, <coughs> they have to go on and they actually have to do um, right. something similar to right. an internship where they, they're working with patients under supervision. So that's where those partnerships come into play, where they're they're actually going to the Barron Center, they're going to Piper Shores and um, learning on site, but there's a classroom element as well. So that's that's where the, that roving bed comes in. We also, I don't know if you've looked at Martin's Point, they've got a large community space that they're donating, and if it's after hours, perhaps there could be some kind of shared space with the exam rooms or something like that, I don't know. But, uh, and the Rotary Club has hospital equipment that they lend out for nothing. All right, Joanne has one more um, area that she's our two more, two more, oh, two more. transportation. Um, <laughs> can I say about transportation? But Scarborough is a very, very large town, and I think all of us forget how large uh, Scarborough is. Um, but Sarah doesn't. Our buses are doing four hundred and fifty thousand miles a year. Um, you know, that's eighteen times around the world. Um, you know, it's really incredible how they um, have done their job this year, being short staffed, and um, how she makes these route works, and the number of kids who have individual transportation, how she fits that in. I know Allison and Chris can talk to uh, about specialized transportation, homeless. Um, for a while, we were transferring, uh, transporting up to Auburn. You know, um, those kind of things put a real impact. It's not just our school buses that are going to and from and bringing kids to and from school. It's all those other little pieces of uh, individualized transportation and so forth uh, that comes into play. Um, if you want to add anything, yeah, I would just say that um, for the homeless transportation, that's something that. Uh, pops up unexpectedly and has to be done right away. Right? We have to get kids connected and back to the school immediately. And uh, Sarah does a, a fantastic job um, with that, trying to manage that stuff on the fly, working with the transportation directors um, to try to come up with creative solutions um, in those situations. So that's been a really great working partnership there. We also employ cab services at times. And, and they are fingerprinted and have to require that uh, documentation, but sometimes we can't meet the need internally. We try not to put little, we don't put little ones in cabs. Mm -hmm. We mentioned that our bus drivers and a lot of our special ed staff don't get to take the summer off. They go through the summer program as well, and uh, transport kids all through some of these. And our, some of our bus drivers work for the summer program <coughs> and also for community service. Um, <coughs> Trying to find bus drivers, like I said, has been a challenge for a good year and a half. We've, I think, we've uh, did a job fair. We've been advertising in the newspaper, online, uh, jobs for Maine, um, calling schools that do training for CDL licenses. But um, it's still an ongoing challenge that um, you know we're hoping that we'll <coughs> find some more people. Um, we provide training for these new drivers. If they don't have their um, CDL license, we are willing to help them to go through the process of uh, getting their uh, permit. And then we have uh, a bus driver at our department that does training. And everyone that he's trained has been successful in getting their CDL license. So um, that's another advantage of if they don't, but they're willing to work and have the qualifications for the job, we're willing to help them get that license. Um, I have to say that over the last seven, six, seven years, the bus department has made a complete turnaround um, in the way they have um, 
in the way they respect one another and the kind of interactions that um, they do to help our kids in Scarborough. I'm just amazed every year in, um, at different holidays, the uh, projects that they will take on, whether it's uh, with Project Grace and hooking up with them and finding out you know, needs and how they can donate, or all of a sudden it's okay, we're gonna, this week, instead of, instead of you going out to lunch, make food donations. And um, so they're very uh, caring into the projects for some of our schools. Um, Sarah, I have to say, is uh, a very talented person in knowing the roots of Scarborough. I think uh, Julie and I sat down with her yesterday <laughs> And I, um, she just amazes me. Uh, yeah, just mid-conversation, she like sketched out a map of a neighborhood and like who lived where and what their child's needs were, like just like on the fly. Yeah, it's all it's amazing. It's all over their head. Pretty amazing. That, that bus route is 29 minutes, but some days because of the traffic at this corner, you will find that it will be you know 37 minutes, and it's like yeah, you know. So pretty amazing. yeah. But I right. have to give a lot of kudos to her for the amount of work that she does. And I have to say that she works seven days a week. Because if Mike has an athletic trip and something happens and it changes, she's on call on Saturdays and Sundays. Sometimes close to 24 hours a day, especially when a story is happening. Yep. The biggest challenge right now during negotiations is the fact that Metro that pays at least four dollars more an hour for entry level for, for a 40 hour week and benefits is going to be taking over the university run and is going to have a regular run to Freeport and Brunswick and I think the Freeport Brunswick runs are going to be consistently increased in the summertime and the next school year the metro is going to take over the university front. So we are really facing a challenge in hiring drivers. That's huge, Jackie. And I, I think you know, not just that, but if you get a CEL license, um, for me as a driver of young people on regular occasions, I would probably be happier in that potato chip truck than with my CDL license making that money than with the bus with 84 kids in it. Not that I don't love children. Hey, this isn't helping our recruitment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I know, I'm not helping in recruitment at all. I'm pointing out the reason why it's really hard to recruit. Very good, Chris. That, that does kind of tie into my question, though. If we provide them training for a CDL license, do we ask them or can we ask them to be retained for a certain we, amount of time? We started doing that. Yeah, okay. we do have a, yeah. a sort of a. I mean, it, it probably wouldn't hold up in court, but we have a contract that says that they agree to provide us with a year's work Yeah, if we train them. So, I'm um, okay. going to keep us on track okay. because we have uh, two more departments in addition to school nutrition. And, uh, school nutrition, as you know, a huge change. This is the second year of our change. It's been a wonderful <laughs> opportunity for a shared service. Um, it, it's worked. Um, the quality of the food, the highlights for this year, you know, intensive training for our staff. It's home cooked food. The theme is buy local. The Thanksgiving dinner and the Valentine's Day dance are, are some highlights that uh, the food, uh, the school nutrition program has been able to provide. The big thing with the budget budget this year is that um, two hundred thousand dollars was added in tax revenue support to go directly to the school nutrition budget. I look at this as we're doing it now instead of on June 30th, okay? That's, I mean, we've been doing this every year on June 30th, and now we're just putting it there, and and, ho and hopefully it will stay. Pulling it out and being much more transparent, yes. so it's right out there up front for the community to see what it costs to, to provide school nutrition. Right. So that, that is a big shift, but that is something that's been talked about for multiple years, and we spoke a little bit to it last night. And just one little other fact, to 22,000 meals are served. I think that's wrong. Per <laughs> year? 2,200. Let's edit that. Is that per year? Per day. Is that per day. 2,200. 2,200. Per day. That makes much more sense. Yeah. Sorry. Awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> We're feeding the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So for the next two presentations, it's going to be um, Todd and then Mike. And so I'll ask that if you could just jot your questions and put them at the end so they can both work through their presentations and um, just be managing our time. The big news before Todd starts is that um, Todd is now a, a published author of four <laughs> novels about our school improvements, our Long Range facility. <laughs> yeah, so if we could start off with the accomplishments, I guess I'd list that one by up there, which have consumed several months of my clearly uh, a team effort. And uh, I just got to be the recipient of lots of information and compile it in addition to what I provided. So um, all four applications are. Um, complete and have been sent to the board, and uh, we'll hear more about it tonight. Oh, sorry, I'm okay, I'm done. Um, <laughs> um, I'll just run down quickly through my points I broke. Todd, my... before you transition, I just want to give you one more video. Um, we are not only is Todd amazing at maintaining our buildings and able to think really strategic about all of our facility needs, but he's also a former former English teacher. Recovering. <laughs> <laughs> so the as you read through as you read through our plan, like just to have that skill set and him to be able to take all of our different pieces and put it together in one voice, I think is um, a little hidden talent that you don't necessarily always get in your director of facilities and maintenance. So um, I'm super grateful for that and thank you for Thanks all for of your efforts. I'm, <laughs> well, I'm sure they'll find an error if you look closely, but um, no. we try to keep it clean as clean as possible. So. I broke my presentation into two sections, operations and capital improvements. Um, the first point is one that you heard during the Long Range Facilities Planning meetings. Obviously, older buildings cost more. Uh, the costs to run those buildings per square foot are listed on the right, and this is all information that was garnered from that Long Range Facilities study. Um, but you can see that um, the two newest buildings in the district, the high school in Wentworth, are clearly the most uh, if efficient cost-wise to run. The high school is less expensive to run than the newest school, Wentworth, because it's not fully air-conditioned. If we fully air-conditioned the high school, that number would be radically different. And I know many of you would love that, and I would love it too, but it isn't. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the adage, the sort of the old main adage, I kind of grew up in you know, a potato farm in the county, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, to use American slang. Uh, that mentality really does cost money. If you ignore old aging things, they will fail on you when you need them the most. So we try not to do that by incorporating preventative maintenance programs on the mechanical pieces in our buildings and uh, roof systems. On a day like today, the, the roof system is the most important part of your building envelope if you've been listening to the rain like I have today and hoping that that roof is nice and watertight. Um, so we, we, we spend a lot of time trying to head off problems at the pass. We don't always uh, win that game 100% of the time, but we do our best. Um, and uh, the other piece I wanted to add was that the more we use the buildings, the more it costs to run and maintain them. So it's not just the school day that the buildings are occupied, as you all know. Uh, it's the evenings, afternoons, evenings, and weekends. And I did a little tally with uh, Dan Hager in Community Services, who does all the scheduling. And this doesn't count athletics and extracurricular school activities. Just community and third-party use is well over a 1,000 hours a year that these buildings are used. Sometimes it's rented, sometimes it's whatever. But it, it's probably closer to 1,200 hours, but I kind of tried to rent. But that's a lot of time. Um, and these buildings don't rest much at all. Um, so, so that's hard on them and it costs a lot of money. So, um, cost drivers for my department, um, wages and labor is 45%. Contracted services um, for the top three trades, I call them building envelope, which is the shell of the building, the roof, the walls, windows, doors, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and electrical. Those are the, the three big um, sort of bread eaters, if you will. And then utilities uh, is an ongoing thing. If you want the lights on and the heat on, uh, we pay to do that. And the heating fuels this year, we were lucky with heating oil. We were really cheap, $1.47 a gallon, which is really cheap. Next year, we're going to be seeing more like $1.80. 
and natural gas is also on the rise. And the problem, the biggest problem there is that there aren't a lot of companies, there's so much natural gas right now, so you think it's going to be cheap, but what happens when there's so much natural gas is it's not worth drilling for it because it costs too much to drill for it and then you don't get it. Uh, you don't get the money you want for it. So they've scaled back drilling and scaled back on building pipelines to New England. So we have one provider for natural gas right now. It's a company called Sprague, and they've been buying up other gas providing companies. So we're going to see an, an increase in the cost of natural gas um, over time as well. And um, then, Tom, we yes. should point out, I, I think people probably know, but all of the utilities for all of the buildings are in Todd's budget. So when you look at his um, pretty little blue chart, he's not nearly as blue as everyone else because um, all of the individual buildings, we're just showing the instructional staff there and the, and the administrative staff. We're not showing any kind of building costs in those um, department budgets. Right. Um, so what we try to do with the buildings is we, we focus on energy savings and saving as much as we can, particularly through electrical improvements, fuel efficiency initiatives, and taking advantage of efficiency main incentives. Um, I'll get to that a little more here. So capital improvements, um, if you look at the top left picture, that's a picture of one of the light fixtures in the high school parking lot. Um, those four rings, we call them pucks, they're LEDs, um, and they have replaced um, a one big giant bulb that are still existing in a few fixtures, about 40 left actually. And the difference there in energy savings is that the old singular bulb is about a 450 watt fixture. These are 126. So we're, when we swap these out, the labor cost is virtually the same, but the energy savings you get is 72 percent and over and they last a lot longer they last 10 years um, the, the current old bulb style burn up in three to five years um, so when they fail we've been replacing them I'm replacing the last 40 and we get an efficiency so that fixture cost 400 bucks and through efficiency mean we get 175 of it back so we, we take advantage of programs like that whenever we can. There's also a program for classroom lighting, other, other high efficiency light fixtures. So we're swapping some out of the middle school right now, uh, changing them from the inefficient, these are LEDs, but the, the ones at the middle school, those can style lights, those are very uh, reasonably inefficient uh, CFL bulbs that are really expensive to dispose of. So we're swapping those out to LED two by two square panels that provide 10 times the light and they're uh, also probably a 15% savings in electricity, and we get incentives for those as well. And the LED technology has changed so much in the past couple of years. Those lights are just indistinguishable and brighter and better than... Yeah, it's been, it's been a dramatic uh, innovation in that part of the electricity lane. Um, we also spend a fair amount of uh, money on equipment. That unit on the right, top right picture is an auto scrubber here from Wentworth. About a $7,000 machine. And if you buy the big one, it's about a $10,000 machine. So we try to get six, seven years out of those before we have to replace them because they're expensive and we have a lot of them. Um, and the state really recommends that we invest 2% of the total value of the physical plant annually. Our physical plant is valued at $130 million, which I think is actually a low number, but $130 million is the most recent appraisal. And so at this level, you know, we should be considering up to $2.6 million a year for CIP for facilities. We don't do that. This year's ask is $769,000 and includes items that are, you know, for equipment, vehicle replacement, school furnishing, site improvement, <coughs> facility support equipment, custodial equipment, and then building repairs for building envelope, the building shell, roof, walls, floors, windows, doors, and then all the mechanical and electrical and security infrastructure components that go into keeping a building running. So um, we're always trying to pay attention to those two pictures at the bottom. One is the middle school roof, which was restored two summers ago. And then the bottom right is a picture of the new um, boiler uh, at Blue Point. We put one new boiler in because it failed. And that unit on the front of the screen is a high efficiency energy management system that we also got a rebate for for installing. So um, wherever we can, we take advantage of those things. And we're a pretty lean operation. There's four maintenance guys.
We run around in red trucks and uh, have about 28 or 29 custodians who functioned virtually without supervision this summer because of my accident, and uh, they did a great job. So can't say enough about the, the lean team. Any questions for Todd? Thank you. Well, that's right, I did say no questions. Uh, moving right along, thank you for the reminder. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Gage, who's going to talk to us about athletics and activities. Well, I'm real excited to share with you about athletics, and I'll watch my friends here roll their eyes in a minute, but I like to say that uh, <laughs> athletics and activities is the front porch of our education uh, programs here, and it's certainly the most visible, it's certainly there's a lot to be proud of, um, and it's really unprecedented, the, um, the level of success we have and the level of involvement we have. And I, I don't mean success just winning and losing um, type of success. Um, I also mean the educational impact that, that we have, um, you know, with our children in the community. So the um, first slide, and I think it's page 65, Kate okay, is um, in, the, in the book is where it starts. But the first slide talks about the impact of our investments um, for this year. So as you know, the money that I, we did receive um, went towards reinvesting into seventh grade sports. Um, and our seventh grade sports numbers are um, approximately that. We're not finished of the, of the year, um, but we're estimating based on uh, where we're at right now and what we did last year. So, so in other words, we served about 122 more students um, than we did uh, because of um, you know, bringing back seventh grade sports. And so, and I think that, um, you know, it's a, those are a great opportunity for our, our middle school students to um, have, those, have those chances at uh, doing something after school and being involved in something. Um, our capital investments were um, also significant, and Kate and Todd have been great about including me in um, the CIP portion. I will say I like Todd's um, little analogy about um, if we ignore old, old things, um, sometimes costs us more instead of doing preventative things. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened in athletics and activities. Um, because as you know, one of my goals has always been to pr present a budget every year that reduces our impact on parent support groups um, to fund the essential components of our programs. We're still not there yet. And this budget still isn't there yet. Um, but it's certainly a step in those directions. Um, we greatly rely on booster support to provide the programs that we provide here in Scarborough. Um, but we've been really fortunate to make some investments. Um, we were able to replace uh, some aging track equipment this year. Perhaps you saw the um, pole vault garage that we have because we not only want to make that investment, but we want to protect that investment a little bit better. Um, and so that's what that's all about. It still doesn't, um, still doesn't uh, keep us from the extra work of storing those in the off season, but during the season, um, it it does certainly help with wear and tear on that equipment, and, and it's expensive stuff. I mean, um, to run the type of program we have and, ha and maintain the type of facilities that we have, there's nothing that's inexpensive about it. Um, and so we've been, um, we've been fortunate to have some, um, have some, have some opportunities at investing in that through the, through the capital improvement budget. Um, we did have some Title IX things that we had to deal with as well, and that was the, the fencing. Um, we, were, uh, we were in a situation where we needed to really 
look at replacing both those fences. Um, they were, there were safety issues uh, related to those fences as well, but um, sometimes we, in athletics, we have to uh, we have to make sure that we're following all the federal rules and Title IX type things as well. So, um, so that's really about um, the the investments that we had this year. The investments moving forward that we want to make is we want to um, have the opportunity to uh, make our assistant athletic trainer a full-time position. Right now it's a uh, 0.5 position and we contract that through an outside vendor. We really want that person to be a full-time employee of Scarborough. I will give you a few numbers. Um, last year, and last year is our best comparison to this year, but last year we had uh, 2,442 treatment contacts um, in the out of the athletic training room. Um, this is just high school primarily. We don't. We're still not at the point of being able to provide much service to middle school students. Um, and those contacts include things such as rehabilitation, um, some uh, you know taping and splinting and those sorts of things too. An additional. 1,551 uh, contacts also were related to wound care and splinting and things like that. So you have the 2,442 to 1,151 and as you can imagine that's multiple contacts. A, a, an injured child might have to be seen every day in the training room to do their ice therapy or their elect, electro, electricity therapy or something like that. So. Um, but it's still a child that the athletic trainer has to, you know, um, work with. We had, um, we administered last year 341 baseline tests for impact testing, uh, which is one tool we use in our concussion management protocol. Um, it's a series of things for concussion management. Impact testing is one of them. We had uh, 49 uh, total post-concussion um, uh, contacts that, that went beyond just a post-test. So 49 kids that had to go through the whole return to play progression. And our athletic trainers work with the school nurses um, in managing the care in accordance with our state law and our school board policies. Um, so that's we're really in a situation where um, we have a lot of participation, which is great. But with that comes um, some added supports that are needed. Uh, and we really need to uh, be in a better situation to provide more care. That's still not, that's still, with all that contact, it's great, but we're still triaging. Um, kids too. Um, so and anytime anybody wants to come and see it for real, you can show up at 2 o'clock in the athletic training room and see it for real. Um, and I'm sure Joe will put you right to work. Um, the second thing is we've improved some efficiencies in our office um, with the use of family ID um, and a new program that we're going to be using called Our School which is a uh, online scheduling program. We use a program, and I've mentioned in the past, we've used a program called Pinwheel to do our scheduling. Um, we're switching over to another program called Our School, which allows a little bit more user friendliness, but also um, gives us opportunities to broaden um, the use of the technology for a variety of things. Um, with the help of Jen and the technology people, we've really, um, taken advantage of, um, I think, maximized our technology usage as best we could in our department with really two people running the whole department. And so um, now, as you can imagine, just like on the academic side when we talk about Phil Callick and the data specialists and those things, 
with improved efficiencies become increased work. I mean, you still have to touch every one of those registrations that are put in the family ID. You still have to produce the lists that, that we need for transportation or medical or paying the activity fee or the hundred different lists that we use for a variety of things. So um, we clearly need some support in terms of administrative support. Additionally, I think the requirements for coaches' eligibility continues to increase. Um, our coaches have up to eight different certifications that are required to be a high school coach, um, and that just recently increased because the MPA actually um, announced today that they're adding a uh, test now um, for all of the coaches that they have to take. So what we have to do to be able to manage that is we'll have to take that test and put it in a Google Doc and the <coughs> tests have to be scored. And, um, so it's another, it's another thing that they have to do. It's a, uh, a rules interpretation test. They want the coaches to be not only go to a rules clinic that they're required to go to, but now they want the coaches to actually do a rules test because they don't think the coaches are um, studying the rules enough, apparently. Um, so anyways, it's a, just another layer. So it becomes a human resource um, task um, in my department. We have a lot of staff people uh, between the middle school and high school, I think well over 100, um, that I'm responsible for my department, that have to be treated equally to any other employee. And so, um, and it becomes uh, uh, a difficult task when you're doing those things and managing, um, you know, the day-to-day -day operational things as well. So, we start out with, of course, I always want more, but um, we start out to see how um, a point five position can uh, make a make an impact in our department as well. So. Uh, some numbers, some numbers just to wrap up. We are um, at the high school level. We have 68% uh, of students that participate in just athletics, 68% different students. Um, that number goes up to about 90% if you add club programs into that. Um, it's similar at the middle school. Um, it's really unprecedented. Um, we've been recognized recently with some nice things. Um, as a department, and I think that um, that is an expression that um, that we're really an example of how things should go. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that um, we have really a simple formula of great coaches, great kids doing great things, and so uh, all feeding into this idea of educational athletics. Um, so that's it. That's it. Thanks. Any questions for Mike or Todd? Jackie? Michael, I think that, uh, that you had a secretary and gave up that position for an assistant athletic director. Is that correct? Well, we didn't give it up. We, we changed the responsibilities slightly. My responsibilities got a little changed, and so we changed the responsibilities of that position. Right. So could you describe Thank how you. Jordan, how you work with Jordan and why that's different than what you're looking for with the business secretary? Yeah, Jordan is, really has picked up a lot more of um, sports information type things, um, the technology pieces, the game management. He does a lot with Family ID right now. We'd really like to, he's really being underutilized his skills. Um, and he's a sports management um, graduate from UNE, and we're not using him to his full potential. And so I think that I'd like him to be in a situation with me to maybe do some more broader thinking about the department, some more um, uh, work on things like uh, the coaches' academy, uh, things that we haven't been able to get off the ground because flat out time. And so. 
I can't pull him away to help with those things um, that are really going to be positively impactful to kids if he's uh, typing things and doing letter, you know, those sorts of tasks. Um, and so it, uh, so it was a transition. When Robin left, we transitioned that position. Um, I picked up some more responsibilities in helping with uh, 504 case management and things like that, um, that, that, were, that I had an opportunity to utilize my education a little bit uh, broader. Um, and so it, uh, it, we, needed, we needed to, uh, to make that adjustment. David? If I could add to that, um, Mike is one of the most unique athletic uh, administrators in the state of Maine. He is a member of our leadership team in the high school and has taken on things that most athletic administrators do not do. He is a significant, has a significant role in what we do in and out of the classroom at the high school and um, has taken on that role and actually has enhanced what we've been able to offer at the high school. So. Those additional demands, it's more than just a five only. Mike's not listing. There's a length, there's a list length of my arm of the things that Mike does, in addition to his responsibilities as an athletic administrator to support what we have in place at the high school. Five oh fours is one small piece to that. So he's an integral part. We need him in that role. He's very good at that. So um, our leadership team completely supports the need for him to be able to use Jordan the capacity that he just described and bring somebody in to do some of the clerical things that holds Michael and Jordan away from some of this, some of the other really important work that they'd like to take on. But I just wanted to, mine's more of, not a question, but more of um, just really appreciate him taking on what he does as a member of our leadership team, which I have never seen that to this degree in any high school in the state of Maine. I'd like to, I'd like to also, um, I really, um, have a professional goal of wanting to spend an increased amount of time with booster groups. Um, we we need to push forward with our uh, our booster policy adjustment. Um, people have come on board with that now, and it's just more of my lack of of time to be able to bring it back to the policy committee. Um, and so. Um, so I, I'd like to be able to spend more time with booster groups. Uh, as you know, booster groups bring in between three and five hundred thousand dollars for our athletic programs, and um, and that requires some attention, and it really should require more attention than it's getting right now. And so that's a professional goal of mine to improve those relationships and build those relationships a little bit deeper. And as you know. Um, every few years, people cycle out, so you have to start all over again. <laughs> and so it's you're always climbing the staircase. You never stop climbing the staircase. And so um, it's, it, that's just the nature of it. Um, but to continue to get that level of support and to continue to have those positive relationships, it needs an investment of time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jackie? I don't mean to diminish what Michael and Jordan do. I'm simply stating a fact that we fought for a couple of years prior to his being athletic director to get, to get the secretary's position. And a conscious effort was made, evidently, to convert that to something else mm -hmm. in last year's budget. I know that that department needs a secretary. There's no doubt in my mind about that. There was no doubt in my mind about that eight years ago. So uh, I just think that when we're talking about priorities, we should know what we're talking about. I think that goes to this common theme of how the work is changing and shifting. And um, it sounds to me, not having been here, but just what I've learned from working with Mike, that you know, given the opportunity to hire Jordan, who has this amazing skill set, um, Mike took advantage of that opportunity in realizing that if he could be used to his full potential, what it could mean for our kids and the programs that we offer um, looks really different than what it is right now. So there is still that need for the clerical, the clerical aspects of the job. They bring in a lot of 
money, they're managing a lot of schedules, there's, you know, just emails in and of itself, you know, we could all use an assistant to handle that, um, <laughs> but I think that uh, every email that Michael gets from a parent with a question requires a lot of research and investigation, much like um, many of our other school leaders, but I would have to say that the level of detail and the time he takes to respond to those is, is really amazing um, and impressive, so... Um, I think that, again, the common theme of how this job is shifting right before our eyes and the amount of support it takes for us to still maintain the high quality that our, I, we know our community expects. Thanks to that. Any other questions or final thoughts? So it's um, exactly right on 6 o'clock. So I believe that dinner has been served over to uh, the side here.